Have you ever heard anything like this? You must accept people the way they are. Well, I can define those things to say that's true. I must accept women to be women, girls to be girls, men to be men, boys to be boys. I must accept the different people, ethnic background, and such things as that. But, you know, that statement is not made in that kind of context. We're living an extremely permissive age. And our society is very worldly. Therefore, you can expect that that's going to be a danger to the spiritual body of Christ, the church. We all have heard this, but yet I don't know of a better illustration. And you build a boat to float in the water. But when you get too much water in the boat... That never was intended. It sinks. There's the ark of safety that God has built, which is the Lord's church, the body of Christ. He meant it to be in the world. And since it's made up of individual Christians, then we are out there in the world. But he never meant for the church to embrace whatever is worldlyism. He never meant it to live like the world, to be motivated by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We see what's happened all around us, even in certain churches of Christ, where people don't want to change people. They don't want to upset folks. And even in your personal life, my life, there are things that we don't want to change. Some of us have had medical conditions that forced us to have to make changes. Others, maybe a job change or something like that. But I'm not speaking just of those things. In fact, that's not where my emphasis is. I'm talking about the difference in a faithful member of the church, a Christian, and one who's not converted, one who is in the world and not living as the New Testament teaches, doesn't know the forgiveness of sins, and is living without the knowledge of God's truth. It's very easy for the church to lower its standards as to the kind of lives her members are to live. The attitude that grows daily is one that we shouldn't seek to change people. We shouldn't seek to denounce evil, especially calling it by name, and if it comes down to it, dealing with individuals that are involved in it. We shouldn't expose doctrines that run contrary and are against the doctrine of Christ. It's the attitude of just simply don't rock the boat. Don't cause any problems. Don't stir up things. And one place where I'm, preach the bulletin was called the edifier well of course we as Christians are to edify one another that is to build one another up in spiritual conduct and living like the Bible says but I printed some articles in that particular bulletin that dealt with exposing error and some of it was close by to where that church was. And one of the elders actually said, I don't see the use of putting that in the bulletin. After all, it's called the edifier. Now understand, this man is an elder. Put that in quotes, please. How do you deal with somebody like that? I simply didn't make a comment, and I just kept on doing what I knew the Bible thought was right, and I never heard anything else about it. And there were certain sermons preached that dealt with that disposition of heart. But that's the attitude of a lot of people. The old saying is, he's stepping on our toes. My automatic remark is, well, if I hit your toes, I, 
I'm sorry because I was aiming at your heart. The cry that goes up around us is to leave me alone in my sin, in my error. What we're saying is, I'd rather see people lost eternally in the devil's hell than have them upset at me for showing them the way of righteousness and rejecting it. Had that been the disposition of mind, the attitude, the mindset of our Lord, do you think he would have ever come to earth? He didn't seek to become adjusted to the ways of the world. He didn't seek to accept people as they were, either explicitly or implicitly throughout the Lord's teaching, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We won't even add the rest of the New Testament to it. He was constantly saying, you must change. The very idea of repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand is you must change your life. Now they lived under the law of Moses. So to the Jews he was saying repent of violating the law of Moses and believe the message the kingdom is at hand and that I am the Messiah. But the gospel still demands repentance on the part of one becoming a Christian, Acts 17.30. And one keeping a penitent mind as they live the Christian life. When you look at the Old Testament, you'll see that God's men of old didn't accept that attitude. Noah didn't accept people as they were in his generation. Writing about the great faithful Noah, the Hebrews writer by inspiration penned in Hebrews 11 and 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Now watch. By the which he condemned the world and became heir of right, the righteousness which is by faith. I see how the Holy Spirit used the Old Testament to make application in the New Testament because that letter was written to Christians who were Jews and because of persecution were actually thinking about giving up the New Testament system. Noah, as a preacher of righteousness, no doubt, had some people that carped at him because he preached it too straight. If our godly behavior and fearless proclamation of God's truth does not condemn the world today there's something sadly lacking in our lives Lot didn't accept people as they were while he was on this earth he made some very poor choices the options he chose but the Bible's clear that he was a righteous man and that the ungodliness of those people in the terrible city where he lived vexed his Life upset him. Second Peter 2, 7, God delivered just Lot, meaning he's justified, vexed with the filthy conversation, the filthy conduct of the wicked. People don't like the idea of saying that their conduct is filthy. The Holy Spirit said they were and they are. I don't like that. Make it nice. Make it nice doesn't necessarily get the point out that God wanted. But you have shallow, pretentious do-gooders of every generation who seek acceptance of the filthy sins which led to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. Lot was spared, but those people in the cities were not. They were not acceptable to God. So the filthy behavior that they did is still filthy behavior today, and they are moral degenerates and perverted. Now, when you say that, people automatically think, well, you'd like to see them all lined up against the wall and shot. No, I'd like to see them repent. 
I'd like to see them be saved in heaven by believing the gospel of Christ, God's power to save, Romans 1, 16. But you don't get them to see the error of their way by simply trying to dodge it and say, well, it's no big thing. But now that's, of course, back in the patriarchal system. But when you look at the prophets of old, you see they didn't put up with that kind of thing either, just accept people as they are. I think of Elijah, who was certainly not willing to accept a bunch of false teachers in his day, 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 40. And after 450 false prophets were slain, well, what was left, I'm sure, didn't feel too kindly toward Elijah and probably said something like, he just is not a very kind man. He could use more love and understanding. But they were the ones at fault, for they had no proper love of God nor love of people in sin warning them to come out of it. But you'll see, Elijah wasn't about to accept them as they were. And we can't please God and accept false teachers in our time. The prophet Isaiah, speaking over 700 years before Christ walked this earth, said to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them, Isaiah 8 and verse 20. Now think of how many people and their philosophies and beliefs today that can apply to. Most of it. Denominationalism is what people think Christianity is, but it's all wrong. It goes against the prayer of Christ for unity in John 17. It goes against the command of Paul to the church at Corinth that there be no divisions among you, 1 Corinthians 1.10, as he described. And yet we're supposed to put up with that. Why can't you just preach the gospel, as one lady told me one time, and let other people along? Why doesn't God just let other people alone? There won't be a day of judgment because he's going to let nobody alone. It won't bother you. Some things don't make good sense. Think about Nathan the prophet and his dealing with King David and his sin. After that terrible sin, this prophet was pretty stern and how he showed David how reprehensible his conduct was. And look what it did for David. It changed that man. It's not likely, at least I don't think, that David would have repented if Nathan had accepted him as he was at that time. In fact, Nathan could have asked what Paul asked the Galatians when he rebuked them for their sins. Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Too often the answer is, yes, you do. You do become my enemy because you told me the truth and I don't like it. John the Immerser, the forerunner of the Christ, John who was sent to get the Jews ready for their Messiah, did not accept people the way they were. Remember, he cried out, old generation of vipers, you bunch of snakes. Most people say they, that, that's not good homiletics. That's not a way to win friends and influence people. But he asked them, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he emphasizes, bring therefore fruit, meat, or suitable for repentance. So it's obvious he wanted them to repent. He wanted them to change. He loved them. He wanted them to be on God's side. He didn't accept Herod as he was. You know that King Herod was living with a woman as his wife that he had no right to have as a wife, just Brother Philip's wife. John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her, Matthew 14, verse 4. I can think of a number of preachers over the years in the church 
They're just not going to emphasize that. And back in the 70s and 80s, even into the 90s, there was a whole lot of teaching being done on the truth of who is eligible for marriage and divorce and remarriage and all those things. I don't hear much of that going on, Brotherhood, why nowadays? And I really wonder how many people, when they come to obey the gospel, I put obey the gospel in quotes, are really asked about or they studied with about God's law on marriage, divorce, or remarriage. It's awful easy just to ignore that. And there's doctrine out there that's been around with some people for a long time that says, well, just get them baptized, their sins are forgiven, they can stay with the woman or man that they're with. Even though that marriage is not according to Matthew 19.6. And the divorce is contrary to Matthew 19.9 and Matthew 5.32. But it's so easy, just don't bring it up. I sometimes think that certain brethren have adopted the view that I saw a long time ago. Usually, on, I think the first time I saw it was on some motorcyclist. Kill them all, let God sort them out. Why? Well, think about it for a minute. Let them alone, let God take of it at the judgment. Well, it's too late then, folks. When you get to the judgment, Hell's your home or heaven's your home. And there's no time for changing. Well, this kind of thing with John the Baptist, when he said it's not lawful for thee to have her stirred up, we might say, a big hornet's nest. And it still stirs it up where you've got people being that loose with God's first ordained institution. There's a lot of just, as we used to say, soft soaping compromisers who simply want to preserve peace among people and that means tolerating and putting up their illicit relationships that people have gotten themselves enmeshed in and well you just accept people where they are that's part of the thing when people say don't judge they mean accept them the way they are well all of it's false doctrine Jesus never did accept people the way they are. And we've seen already before the flood, after the flood, the prophets, they didn't do that. And now just come, as we've been mentioning all along, to our Lord and his work. The words of Jesus clearly shows that he simply did not accept people as they were. To religious leaders, he said, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. That's pretty tough. Remember how he accused them of shutting up God's kingdom against men? He accused them of devouring widows' houses, of making pretentious prayers, of overlooking the weightier matters of the law, of putting on a big outward show, he says, you're like whited sepulchers. Outside you look good, and inside you're full of dead men's bones and all manner of corruption. And so he concluded in Matthew 23, 33, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Matthew 23, 33. He didn't accept them, and he, and he wasn't too overly concerned about Tact and diplomacy. Have you ever looked into some of the curriculum of these uh, schools that purport to be, and I forget the exact name of them, where they are supposed to try to go and work with people who are out of odds with one another and get them all settled down? I can't remember the name of it now. Arbitrator or something like that. And every one of them are trying to say, well, you can't point your finger at him or her because you got wrong in your life. And so they both basically are taught to settle the matter by saying, you're wrong and you're wrong. We can't get upset about it because we're all in a mess. Let's just pick up, not fight over it and go on. Well, I can't find that in my Bible. Luke 13, 3 and 5, Jesus said, I tell you, no. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Do you know there's a, when people get to where they accept error, it becomes a part of their life. 
as this society has become with many, the truth sounds harsh and hateful and mean and very strange because they haven't been exposed to it. Jesus came into the world because people were not acceptable to God. They were separated from God by sin. And if they died in their sins, they couldn't be in heaven. Paul wrote to Timothy, a young evangelist, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul said of himself, of whom I am chief. Paul confessed that he had been a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious. He held the clothes of those as they stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And surely he knew in that state he was not accepted as he was. He had to do some tremendous changing. So men must change to be accepted. If we were to go out here and have a crowd of people gathered in here, uh, not in just room, but somewhere else, or if this building were overflowing, half of them are not members of the church. This needs to be preached. A lot of times the church has problems because the people who have been baptized really never were converted from the ways of the world. And they bring that with them, lock, stock, and barrel. And thus they deal with things like the world does. Of the Ephesian saints, the inspired apostle Paul wrote this, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, as he wrote that letter to them, now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes afar off are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. They were not acceptable to God as they were. There had to be a resolve on their part that whatever there is in my life that is contrary to the teachings of Christ, I'm getting rid of it. They couldn't be accepted the way they were. But now they were accepted. That implies they obeyed the gospel from the heart, Romans 6, 17, and 18. In his letter to the church at Corinth, notice some of the people that had been converted and were members at the time he wrote that letter. He listed fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, Thieves, drunkards, covetous, revilers, extortioners, and others, homosexuals included. Then he said, and such were. Were is past tense. That's what you were. You're not that way anymore. But that was where you were in the world when the gospel came to you. Because they believed that gospel, and obeyed it, he says, but now you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name, that means by the authority of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Folks, these folks we, we consider to be reprobates, degenerates. And certainly they could not be accepted in that state. But the great gospel of Christ changed them. Their belief in Christ was mentally accepting the fact that he existed, but their belief was a faith that led them to put their trust in him and obey him. Thus he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. So they weren't accepted of God except that they changed. And so Paul addressed them as sanctified in Christ Jesus in the second verse of 1 Corinthians 1. Then you come down to Peter's writing, and Peter said that God hath begotten us again unto a lively hope 
by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. Well, God has done his part. He offered the way of change through Christ and the gospel. Notice, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. 1 Peter 1 verse 14. They were not accepted until they had changed. Now, going on in, in the same chapter, Peter said of them, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Verse 22. There's just no way you can change yourself except to obey Christ. It's always going to be that way as long as you live in the church. You cease obeying Christ, you apostatize. However, if somebody gets you to do that, it's another story, but that's the simple way it is. Whatever gets you to disobey Christ causes you to sin, and if you stay that way, you're lost. So when we seek to keep the church, the Lord's church, and every member of it faithful, then we have to have the Christian attitude toward the world. And we're solemnly, very solemnly warned about the acceptance of worldliness. John tells us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Then what? If you do, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2, 15. When you look at some members of the church, what difference is there in them and those outside of Christ. Very little. And be not conformed to this world, Paul wrote. Let me say that again. And be not conformed to this world. Don't be like it. Don't see things as worldly people do who are ignorant of the Bible and don't care about it. But be ye transformed. Well, there's a way that works. You've seen these movies, the Transformers. They change from one thing to another. Well, that's the way it is in conversion. And all your life in living faithful in the church, you're transforming yourself. He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? First of all, by the renewing of your mind. You learn the truth, and you live by it. You answer people with the truth. You answer your questions with the truth. Because you study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. He says, you do that, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you don't know the Bible, you don't know up from down when it comes to what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need to emphasize to people the cost of discipleship. It's not just enough to get wet and then get in the church and you think you are and you just continue to live like the rest of the world. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, that ye put off concerning the former conversation or manner of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. And be ye renewed in the spirit of your minds. Like basically what Paul did in Romans 12 too. And that ye put on the new man. That's my responsibility. Which after God is created. How? In righteousness and true holiness. Try to do that without knowing your Bible. Without determination to follow the Bible. Learning how to ascertain the authority of Christ. You can't do it. The old man must die. We must put him to death. And a new man in Christ is then accepted the Lord. He's new because, first of all, in obedience to the gospel and being baptized into Christ as a penitent believer who's confessed Christ as Savior, all those past sins are washed away in the blood of the Lamb when one's baptized. Well, what about the future? Well, we're talking about the future. We seek to follow the truth, study it, live it, grow in knowledge of it. Preach it, teach it, defend it, rebuke ourselves, examine ourselves, help the brethren walk the straight and narrow way. Then we become more like Christ every day, and there is no other way to do that. 
It's not proper for one who has been raised to walk in the newness of life, as Paul wrote Romans 6, 4, to continue to live a life of purpose sin. Writing basically the same thing to the Colossians in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, then notice my responsibility. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Notice he says it, and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. We change into the image of Christ to be accepted of him, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So we're told, and it's our responsibility to follow it, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5.11. There's two things in that. If you're faithful to God as a Christian, you don't have anything to do with that which is contrary to the Bible, but it did not stop there. I have the obligation to reprove people in sin. Now that's when the rubber hits the road. In the case of Stephen, that's when the rocks flew. But I can't just say I won't be a part of evil. I must determine to be a part of good. And part of that good is to reprove the sinners round about us. Do we do that? It's part of the way we're the leavening for good in the world. It's part of the way we impress people with the truth. Closing, I want to end with we must have the proper attitude toward false teachers. I've seen this happen now as time has gone on. The church is just not that concerned about doctrine anymore. When you get concerned about the doctrine of Christ, knowing it will be the final standard of judgment on the day of judgment, you want to know what it teaches. And you want to abide by it. Because you know you sin if you don't. That's the point made by Paul. He wrote to Christians in Rome in Romans 6, 17, and 18. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Used to be. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin. Now watch it. You became the servant slaves of righteousness. You anchored yourself in the truth. When you obeyed it. And now you put yourself as a slave does to a master. Not because he's going to treat you wrong and you don't want to. Because you want to. You want to go to heaven. I suggest sometimes we get up in the morning and we hardly look in the mirror. As we're trying to get everything else arranged. And say, do you really want to go to heaven? And then maybe answer it. Yes. I, above all things on this earth want to be in heaven eternally. Maybe we'll do that several times a day. So an ever-increasing tirade is directed against uncompromising preachers and those that teach the truth because they simply will not accept religious teachers as they are. But that's one of the things God has forcefully taught on. I don't know how you can read much of the Bible at all. And not see that. It was Paul who wrote, If any man preach any other gospel, meaning a gospel of a different kind from what he preached to them, unto you than ye have received, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Let him be cut off from God. Galatians 1 9. That's how serious it is to be a false teacher. When inspiration says a false teacher ought to be cut off from God, that means he's headed for hell for sure. I don't think you can call that fraternizing with false teachers. John said, simple language, but so powerful. We'll end with this. 2 John 9 through 11. Whosoever transgresseth, the American standard said, goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. Then he dropped down. And said, if there come unto any of you, and bring not this doctrine, neither receive him into your house, 
bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. How can you not be concerned about whether you're following the doctrine of Christ or not? And how can you as a Christian not be concerned about whether other people are? God will not accept people just as they are in the way we've defined that in this particular study. He just will not do it. The church then to be the leavening influence for good must teach the people round about. And it begins even with our children. Make it clear to your children for you to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You can't just go to heaven and live any way you want to live. Mom and Daddy love you, but our love will not let us be quiet about the wicked life you're living. Now you start out when they're little and try to show them. Make it clear. Why not point out to them some of the wickedness that's out there? They're going to see it and teach them. Show them. And as you do so, point it out to them from the Bible. I don't know what, as I said many years ago about this congregation, what this building will be used for in 10, 20, 30 years. If it'll even be here, of course. But if religious people are still gathering in this building, what will they believe? What will they practice? How will they worship? It doesn't take but a few changes. And we're blown away. To use an old phrase, gone with the wind. And usually it's gone with the wind to false doctrine. A laxagasical attitude. You younger people, when some of us are gone, who's going to take care of teaching these classes? Who's going to take care of eldering the church? Who's going to take care of the things God says the church must do in order to be his church? Who's going to discharge the obligations? It's appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment. With some of us, we can't have too many more years left. But who's going to be these things? You must think of that. You must plan. You must purpose. You must pray. It's all a part of being what God says we ought to be. And the thing you need to do is act now, if you haven't been, to change your life to mean something to this congregation. And that's true of any congregation in the country, some more so than others. If you need to obey the gospel, we've studied what to do to become a Christian. As a child of God, if you need to repent of sins, Confess them and pray to God for forgiveness. We urge you to do that while we stand and sing.